All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kalindi Parikh, Program Builder at Current, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this month's Third Coast Water Seminar. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the amazing team behind this event series, including Northwestern University, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Argonne National Lab, University of Chicago, and University of Illinois at Chicago. This team is really leading the charge on water innovation in our region and brought us an awesome speaker today who will highlight his work on electrocatalytic reduction of nitrate in drinking water. If this is your first Third Coast, then welcome. Just to start with a few quick logistics, we love to hear from the audience during these events, so please submit questions through the Q&A tab throughout the event and feel free to send comments through the chat. This event will also be recorded and shared with you all and current audience on YouTube after the event concludes. We have a pretty simple agenda today um, that will highlight a significant speaker from the water research community and we'll give you, our audience, a chance to engage through questions. I'll start with a brief introduction about Current and what we do and then pass it off to one of my Third Coast colleagues, Brian Chaplin, who will introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charles Worth. He'll present for about 40 minutes and we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So be sure to send your questions throughout the presentation and we'll end on some closing remarks and let you get back to your afternoon. So a bit of background on Current before we start. Current is Chicago's water innovation hub. We've been around for just over five years now and we're tasked with the mission of growing an inclusive blue economy, accelerating innovation and solving persistent water challenges. So why are we here? Well, we're here because we believe that we all need more healthy water to drink and less flood water in our basements. We want healthy people, equity, and healthy environments both locally here in Chicago and in Illinois and globally as we deal with the effects of climate change. But we also want to address the economic disparities by leveraging the innovation happening here in Chicago, in Chicago um, to get Chicagoans ready for blue jobs at homegrown companies solving those global water challenges. And so the challenge that we're seeing here in Illinois is that people are not rallying fast enough around innovative ideas that will help us protect our health and environment. This is why Current builds partnerships and collaborations that allow us to solve problems across sectors and take some of the risk out of new and innovative approaches. One example of a way that Current does this is by being an unbiased advocate for the best water solutions and policies. We are always scanning for new innovations in water and assessing new technologies and often making recommendations to our partners or even running pilots ourselves. So more than just a connector though, um, Current often tests new technologies in house and with our partners. So for example, the, the picture you see on the right there is actually one of our team members pulling a water quality sample from the river as part of our H2Now real-time water quality monitoring pilot. Um, this is a really hands-on project and everyone on our team gets involved with the water quality monitoring. This pilot, pilot just launched to the public in the fall and we're gearing up for another season starting this spring and really looking forward to that. We're also excited to continue work on some emerging areas of interest, including our sewage surveillance work, surveillance work that lets us track COVID-19 through wastewater, looking at strategies to reduce nutrient contamination in waterways here in Illinois, capturing and using renewable energy from wastewater heat recovery, and eliminating PFAS and other forever chemicals that threaten our water quality. And finally, tying together so much of this work is a regional strategy to grow an inclusive and equitable blue economy, where what we envision is that anyone can develop an interest in water and follow that interest into education and high quality jobs. This strategy, which is currently being developed by um, Current and our partners, also uplifts and promotes water stewardship from our corporate community here in Illinois, ensuring that we're striking that balance between leveraging our water resources for economic growth, but also protecting those resources for the future. So now to transition to today's topic, I wanna to turn it over to one of our Third Coast collaborators, Brian Chaplin. Brian is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and the Department of Civil Materials and Environmental Engineering at UIC. And Brian's gonna introduce our speaker today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Lindy. And so it's yeah, my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Charlie Worth, uh, who is a good friend, colleague, as well as a, a mentor. Uh, Dr. Worth is a professor and the Betty Margaret Smith Chair in Environmental Health Engineering at University of Texas at Austin. His research and teaching primarily focus on reactive transport of water pollutants and porous media, 
with applications to electrocatalytic water treatment, groundwater remediation, and geological carbon sequestration. He is currently an editor of the Journal of Contaminant Hydrology and previously served on the US EPA Science Advisory Board. He received his BS degree in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M and MS and BS degrees in environmental engineering from Stanford University. He started his academic career at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before moving to uh, Texas at Austin. And that's where we got to know each, each other back, I think in 2003, I started the PhD program under his guidance. And so it's hard to believe that it's been 20 years and uh, a coincidence may have it. My research topic back then was catalytic water treatment of nitrate, which is also a continuing uh, challenge. And Charlie will uh, talk about some of the updates, I guess, in the last 20 years of researching catalytic water uh, treatment for nitrate. So I'll turn it over to you, Charlie. Thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. Let me uh, figure out how to share and get my presentation up. Let me just take a sec. And then, uh, let's see, should be pulling up. There he goes. Can y'all see it? I assume that's a yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, present here at the Third Coast Water uh, Series. It's um, really great. Uh, to have Brian introduce me and to be part of this. Um, I have a certainly a, a strong attraction to Illinois and to the University of Illinois, you know, strong, you know, a lot of fond memories. And so it's uh, great to see some old friends and uh, be part of this community uh, again briefly. So um, I'm going to talk about electrocatalytic treatment of nitrate, um, specifically about some in, um, new type of cathodic materials we've been working on uh, to advance this process. I have uh, three current students working on this effort, uh, Chen Shu, Jacob, and Eric, and then some uh, collaborators that we've been working with recently at Iowa, Dave Schwartney and Syed Mubin, and at the University of Texas in chemistry, Simon Humphrey and Graham Henkelman. And then uh, over the years, I've had uh, uh, MS and PhD students, quite a few work on this topic. And then also had some uh, great collaborators, uh, Bill Schneider, Tim Strathman, and John Shapley. Uh, most of our funding over the years have come from the NSF. And then uh, we had a, one grant from the EPA in there. And then uh, very recently, we got some uh, funding for this from the UT Austin Portugal program. So um, most of you are probably familiar with nitrate, that its primary source are agricultural activities. Uh, you get ammonia or ammonia nitrate uh, from different types of fertilizers. Uh, you get ammonia in feedlot runoff and that goes through nitrification and then you stall at nitrate and it persists in these uh, uh, surface and groundwater environments. Um, nitrate is the most common groundwater pollutant in the world and in the United States. In this map, it just shows uh, kind of the estimated uh, levels of nitrate that you have throughout the US. Uh, as you might expect, uh, they reflect somewhat where we have inputs of nitrogen, mainly from fertilizer. And so uh, if you think about we need higher yields or we want increasingly higher yields in agriculture, and we still haven't quite figured out uh, how to target those nutrients. And so we oversupply nitrate to increase those yields. And so we get a lot of runoff of this uh, hazardous pollutant into waterways. The go-to technology when water treatment plants are faced with nitrate problems is ion exchange. And so in the upper right, you see some big tanks there and these hold these resins. And so water flows through there and you have these like little beads, uh, you know, you think that like uh, small little spheres of resin packed all in there. And as the water flows through, initially you have chloride adsorbed to the resin surfaces and your nitrate contaminated water flows through and that nitrate displaces the chloride and then you remove it from the chloride or remove it from the water. Since the nitrate's only at, you know, milligram per liter levels, uh, the chloride that you kick off doesn't uh, harm the water at all. It's innocuous at that level. And so you get a uh, high quality drinking water. Uh, when you exhaust that resin, you bring back a really high concentrated salt solution, very high chloride, 10 weight percent. And you do that so with a small amount of water, you can regenerate that resin. And so you come back in and you kick that off. 
And what happens then is you get a really salty waste brine that has high nitrate concentration in it. So showing over here to the right is just a system that's sold by Calgon or, um, um, and in it, there's a, a rotating turn. It has these vessels on it. They each contain the resin. And so some of them are cleaning while others are being regenerated. And then you generate this discharge, this, this discharge that um, maybe in the Midwest, it might go to the sewer along the coastline. It might go to the ocean. It could also go to evaporation ponds. Um, and in that process, we use a lot of salt. In fact, for each gallon of water treated, we use 60 grams of salt. It's a lot. So when we think about that salt use, it dominates the cost and also the environmental burden of ion exchange. Um, you can be looking at up to 80% of operation and maintenance for this ion exchange go to salt cost. Uh, it can also dominate uh, the overall cost, even when you consider uh, capital costs over a 15 or 20 year lifetime. Uh, also, this high nitrate in the waste brine uh, contributes to eutrophication of lakes and uh, certainly to hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and other uh, sorts of uh, oxygen depletion type situations. So it uh, represents a, a, a big issue. So what we started working on uh, quite some time ago was catalytic treatment. In fact, uh, Brian was the first PhD student I had uh, to work on this. And so the idea is, is pretty simple. You've got uh, some active metals, uh, palladium or some other platinum group metal and a promoter metal like indium. And um, the platinum group metal palladium, uh, you have H2 gas come in, it dissolves in water and comes to the surface of the palladium. It dissociates into atomic hydrogen. Uh, part of it spills over onto that indium and then the nitrate comes in and it's reduced. And so you take away an oxygen from the nitrate, it combines with the atomic hydrogen and you get H2O and now you have nitrite. Now that nitrite and the subsequent products can react just on the palladium. They don't need the indium anymore. And so still you have hydrogen, which splits and provides that electron donating capacity and you reduce that nitrite all the way to either uh, N2, uh, nitrogen gas or ammonia, uh, NH3. And so depending on your situation, uh, if you're doing direct drinking water treatment, you'd like to get N2 so you don't have to worry about any toxicity with ammonia. Uh, maybe if you're doing a, a brine treatment, uh, you might want ammonia so you could do some resource recovery. Um, so conceptually, it's a pretty straightforward. Um, when you look at the experiments, uh, they're also fairly straightforward. We oftentimes do it in batch to measure the activity of the catalyst that we develop. And both we and many others have uh, identified that uh, nitrate reduction rates in these batch systems are fast, and we can control selectivity for that dinitrogen gas or ammonia. Um, uh, over in the bottom right, you can see nitrate going away. In this case, we have an intermediate N2O, nitrous oxide coming up and going away. And then our main endpoints here, we get a mix for this catalyst between N2 and ammonia. Um, if we use palladium and indium, uh, we can often select almost exclusively for N2. Um, Brian showed that in his early work. Um, Tim Strathman showed uh, more recently, if you use ruthenium, you can select almost all for uh, ammonia. And so we have pretty good uh, selectivity and uh, what I'll show uh, a, a little later is good kinetics in terms of uh, something that could be cost competitive. We can't use batch reactors in full-scale water systems. Uh, these particles, these catalyst particles, they bang against each other, they break apart, they lose metals. And so we look at a basically a fixed bed system, something where we hold the catalyst in place and we flow water through it. Um, because hydrogen only dissolves in water to a very low maximum concentration, we have to deliver hydrogen in the gas phase to get enough of it in there. And so what we did was we developed a trickle bed reactor uh, to de de deliver the nitrate uh, or the water with nitrate into the top along with hydrogen gas. As they flow through the reactor, they mix, the hydrogen dissolves into the water it goes to the catalyst surface, and then we get this reaction where we promote that conversion of nitrate to dinitrogen or ammonia. Um, also, in this case, we use CO2 as a buffer. Uh, that reaction, it increases the pH, and so we maintain the pH by providing that CO2. In the bottom left side, I have a little schematic here, and you can imagine that 
And we have this water film that surrounds these uh, activated carbon particles that have the catalyst metals on the outside. And depending on the flow rates of the gas and the water, we can change the thickness of that water film and kind of that boundary layer, both uh, on the gas side. And that's going to affect how fast that hydrogen gas can transfer into the water and to that catalyst particle surface. So what we did then is we built this system uh, mainly out of parts from uh, Home Depot. If you look at this thing, it looks like uh, plumbing uh, that's in your house, uh, but it's filled with catalyst particles and we have uh, the meters and things to deliver the flows uh, as we need it. We explored different catalysts and batch and used the one that gave the best activity that's shown here. We varied hydrogen flow rates over a, a fairly large range and water flow rates also uh, varied them to look at where we get the optimal activity. And as I mentioned, we have CO2 going through here to control pH. Um, what I'm gonna show you is just the results of that where we look at the influent and effluent concentrations. And from that, uh, we get a rate constant. So zero order rate constant that's normalized by the mass of palladium. The results from our trickle bed reactor are in the middle of that plot on the right. Um, you see values between uh, eight and 19, roughly. Um, if you look at comparable rates for batch reaction, they're a lot higher. They're about 10 times higher. They're on the order of, I don't know, 160, 210. Uh, so we're getting much better activity in batch than we are in the trickle bed reactor. Um, if you look at other reactors at the time that were in the literature for fixed bed react type reactors, they were quite a bit lower. We have two and five and two down there. So uh, quite a bit lower rate. So we've improved what's been done in the literature, uh, but we aren't near what the batch rates are. And so that's a concern. Um, one thing we wanna do is try to understand what's limiting the overall rate of reaction. We anticipated it was the mass transfer rate of hydrogen to that catalyst surface. And so we have just a series of, of three uh, uh, reaction equations here. One is for nitrate as it flows through the water phase and reacts, that's the top one. The middle one is for hydrogen gas in the liquid. It's coming from the gas phase. So we have that mass transfer rate term, that uh, K sub GLH times A. Um, and then we have uh, the hydrogen also reacting in the liquid phase. And then the bottom uh, term there is just for the gas, the hydrogen gas flowing in the gas phase through the reactor and then transferring to the liquid. And so from that, uh, we could come up with this plot uh, where we compare the rate of these catalysts in a batch system with the rate in our trickle bed reactor on the vertical axis. And what you see is that for the batch systems, uh, we have values going from zero to a thousand, uh, but for the trickle bed reactor, we have values going from zero to like 27. And if you look where our best results are, our activity from the batch system are uh, close to a hundred and our activity for the trickle bed reactor are only about 18. So we're what roughly uh, five uh, or more times slower uh, for that. And so, what is happening, and when we look at our mass transfer rates and compare those to the reaction rates, is that this system is mass transfer limited. The hydrogen, regardless of this range of flow rates and hydrogen and water that we evaluate, is just too slow in transferring hydrogen over to the liquid phase and then to the catalyst surface to get at or to approach the intrinsic rates that these catalysts can provide. And so that is a concern. Um, if we look at costs, what does that mean? Um, on the top part of this table, you can see uh, ion exchange costs. And so on the left column, there's the salt cost. Uh, next is the disposal cost for that waste brine. Then you have the total ion exchange O&M cost there, the third column. The capital costs are the fourth column. And then over to the right of that top part is the ion exchange total cost. And so they go from anywhere from 37 cents to $8.03 per thousand gallons of water treated. And that's a big range and it depends on what you're allowed to do in terms of disposal mainly uh, for uh, that uh, ion exchange waste brine. If you look at catalytic treatment, uh, we have hydrogen gas costs, uh, palladium costs, and then total costs. And so um, these different costs depend on how often we have to replace the palladium catalyst. The top one's every 20 years, which isn't realistic, but showing for comparison. The middle one is every five years and the bottom one is 
every year. And probably every between one and five years is a more realistic, uh, um, I think, scenario. So what we see is that the costs are approaching ion exchange, but still uh, uh, on the high side, at least if we're looking at the lower end of that ion exchange system. Um, also, these results are for the trickle bed reactor. Uh, that's where we get the palladium costs. If we have faster activity, we can lower those palladium costs. So if we could get down to the intrinsic activity, uh, the palladium costs might be lowered by a factor of 10 or at least five. And so that shows you where we really need to look at how can we get higher activity. So that caused us to pivot. And this was some years ago. And we kind of had this moment where we said, wow, maybe we can't get any better activity uh, if we're going to run this uh, reactor under ambient conditions with hydrogen gas. So we thought, well, let's, let's look into electrocatalytic reduction. And so use, instead of using hydrogen gas where it transfers from a gas to the liquid phase, we said, well, let's create atomic hydrogen directly from protons and electrons. It combines uh, on the surface of the metal. Um, the platinum group metal could be palladium here. We create that atomic hydrogen. Some of it spills over to the promoter metal, that PM. That could be your indium. And again, we have the same uh, series of reactions where nitrate then converts to N2 or ammonia. Um, we could also have just direct electron transfer to the nitrate in those intermediate species. I don't show that here, but that's another pathway that's possible with electrocatalytic reduction. So um, the first thing we did is we designed and built a two-cell electrochemical reactor uh, based on flax sheet electrodes. Sometimes it's called a filter press reactor. Uh, if you look at this system, there's a little black square in the middle of it and the cartoon version in the middle. And that black square is our electrode or our cathode. And that's a activated carbon cloth and it's decorated with different metals that I'll uh, talk about during the presentation going forward. Um, we have uh, flow channels on the top and the bottom of that cloth that are created by these inserts. And then we separate it from the anodic uh, chamber by a naphion membrane. And below that, uh, we have our anode along with the chambers for flow above and below it. And so flow with nitrate comes in uh, through the inlet. It flows in across that cathode sheet and out. Ideally, we have our effluent with no nitrate. And so that's the overall idea. There's a photograph of our reactor at the top. Uh, we put that into a recirculating system. So here's our reactor over to the right. We have a reservoir to the left. And so we're recirculating through that at a high rate. So you get kind of a, a semi-batch type system in this configuration. Um, this is just a photograph of our activated uh, carbon uh, cloth. Initially, we looked at palladium and indium because we'd use those with uh, the catalytic system. And the XRD spectra just shows that palladium is deposited on the surface. And then if you look at the TEM image, you can see we get a good dispersion of those uh, palladium uh, particles, which are decorated with small amounts of indium and a mono dispersed size particle distribution on the order of a few nanometers. So the first thing we did is we started with nitrite. It's the second intermediate or the first intermediate um, is that you get when you transform nitrate, you first get nitrite. And we started with nitrite because it's generally a little easier to convert the nitrate. Um, and, um, and we thought that that would be a good way to test our electrocatalytic reactor. Um, if you look at the uh, top left here, it just shows the decrease in nitrate over time. We're recirculating that flow through the reactor. And so the concentration is going down over time as it reacts in there. We did this uh, or measured these profiles for different uh, reduction potentials for minus 0.4 all the way to minus one um, volt relative to a silver silver chloride electrode. Um, there's a couple of things to take home here. We're interested in the rate. We want the highest bar is the highest rate. And we also want the highest current efficiency or Faraday efficiency. And what that means is that we're supplying a current, right? And that current is a flow of electrons. And we want all those electrons to go to reduce nitrate. Um, what we don't want is for us to give so much potential that those electrons uh, basically form hydrogen gas and that hydrogen gas goes off into the atmosphere. And so we don't use it for reduction of the nitrate. We waste that electric current. And so when you look at this, what you find is that at minus 0.6 volts, we get our best combination of activity uh, and also current efficiency. And we're around 50%, that's pretty good. 
Um, and so you can see that from the table at minus 0.6 volts, we get a, a fairly good activity, uh, 0.42, and then we get a fairly good current efficiency around 50%. And these rates that we're getting are comparable to our batch system. So they're quite high and quite a bit higher than that trickle bed reactor. Um, we also get very good selectivity for dinitrogen around 95% here. Ammonia selectivity uh, would be 5%. And so the rest goes to dinitrogen. So that was really encouraging. Uh, we were pretty excited by those results. We wanted to make sure that our reactor wasn't mass transfer limited. Uh, so we again developed a model. And what we did with the model then is we simulated uh, with, after uh, fitting our data, nitrite removal versus that intrinsic reaction rate or what you might get in batch. Um, those intrinsic rates for our catalysts are right here, are the circles. And so we're in this zone. And what you see where the lines are linear, it means that we do not have mass transfer limitations or very little mass transfer. It's mainly uh, limited by that intrinsic reaction rate, that nitrite removal. And as it starts to plateau is where we get mass transfer limitations. So we currently aren't making catalysts that have intrinsic reaction rates above say 10 to the minus four. And so that isn't a concern for our system. We are not mass transfer limited. So that's great news. We have a reactor. It has a high reactivity. It's not limited uh, or it's very, uh, it's mainly limited by the intrinsic reaction rate and we're getting a reaction that's order of batch systems. Um, another thing we wanted to do is compare our activity to those in the literature. In the literature, uh, they, uh, people report activity in many different ways. And so what we did was uh, use their reaction rate uh, constants with the reaction order that they reported and the constant, uh, well, the reaction orders that they reported uh, uh, and using the equations that they did to characterize that. And we calculated the time to reduce nitrate or nitrate from 80 to 40 milligrams per liter. And so for our system, we get uh, something on the order of one to two minutes. And you can look at the other times. Most of them are quite a bit longer. We have some others which are uh, very close. So, uh, you know, statistically probably about the same. Uh, and then we have one which is quite low. This is for a single compartment batch cell. It's not a flow through system. And so it's not something that you would have in a, 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 a water treatment type or application. Uh, nonetheless, it's quite high. Um, uh, and so just in terms of performance, it looks like our system and the cathode that we're using has a very high potential uh, uh, for use. And so that's cool. So then we thought, well, let's change the nitrate. And so we changed the nitrate. And so this is what I showed you before from the prior slide. And then on the right is the one for nitrate. And I have to apologize here. The uh, x-axis, the, the sign is reversed. So here we go from uh, more negative goes to the left for the nitrite, but for the nitrate, more negative goes to the right. So you have to compare them like mirror images. Uh, but what you see is that for the nitrate, we really don't start getting uh, good activity. Uh, these have the same scale for the rate constant K. We really don't start getting good activity until you get to about minus 1.2 volts or minus 1.5 volts. So we have to go uh, put uh, quite a bit more uh, potential across that. But more importantly, we see that our current efficiency is really low. It's around two or 3%. And we're seeing lots of uh, hydrogen gas evolution. And so basically that means that when we're trying to reduce this nitrate, we have to apply uh, enough over potential that we're getting uh, hydrogen gas evolution. And that's really reducing the amount of electrons or current that's going for nitrate reduction. Um, another thing we found is that selectivity for the dinitrogen uh, was uh, uh, not near as good in this case, and I'll show you later. So uh, we wanted to understand why that's occurring, and so we did this multi-step chronoamperometry. And so shown on the left is that solution that we have both uh, that we're running through the reactor. We have first nitrite free and then with nitrite. And what you find is that you lower the reduction potential. Uh, you can see where current is starting to be generated to, uh, uh, to have atomic hydrogen be uh, created on the surface of the catalyst. And then when nitrite is present, we have current being generated for that. And then we get hydrogen evolution as you go farther to the left or apply a, a more over potential. When we don't have any nitrite present, this uh, current 
is delayed, it doesn't come down for nitrite reduction and it just comes down where we get this hydrogen evolution. So basically that means that if we pick something around minus 0.6 volts, which was our optimal for nitrite, we're gonna get good nitrite reduction without too much hydrogen gas generation. That's what we want. So we want this curve with the pollutant nitrate or nitrite to be shifted to the right. If we look here for the nitrate, uh, the points, the lines are a little deceiving, but the points basically fall on top of each other. And so we aren't really getting nitrate reduction without hydrogen evolution. And that's why our current efficiencies are so poor. So how can we address that? One way we thought to address that will, was just by changing the experimental setup and say, well, what if we treat really high concentrations of nitrate, something that we might have in a waste brine uh, from an ion exchange system? And so we increased the nitrate concentration flowing through our system. Uh, we got improvements in the rate, and we also got uh, big improvements in the current efficiency. And that's because if you think about what's happening at the surface, as we increase nitrate concentrations, we have more coverage of the surface with nitrogen species, and that displaces the atomic hydrogen. And so you get more chances, uh, basically, for the atomic hydrogen that's provided to the react with those nitrogen species. Um, also, it's likely uh, that the N2 selectivity is high. Uh, we haven't measured it yet, but with all that uh, N nitrogen species at the surface, you have a higher chance for NN pairing. Uh, so that was really great. Um, uh, but uh, we couldn't uh, come up with, uh, or with that catalyst uh, uh, configuration, we couldn't get good selectivity or current efficiency at the low nitrate concentrations. So we dug into the literature and tried to figure out what other metals might perform better than palladium and indium. And there was a really nice paper by Brian Goldsmith and his students. And here they were using a, a theoretical approach called density functional theory to calculate um, what pure and mixed metals could have high turnover frequency for nitrate. And you could simply think of that as the reaction rate uh, being higher with the higher turnover frequency. Um, um, uh, when you were very close to uh, zero volts relative to that standard hydrogen electrode. And I, I should mention that zero volts relative to the hydrogen electrode is the same thing as about minus 0.6 volts uh, relative to the silver, silver chloride electrode, which is what we've been using and I've been reporting. So what you see are copper and nickel and iridium and cobalt and ruthenium all fall on this line where I have the highest reaction rate. Um, and that's great. And uh, it's plotted versus the uh, nitrogen adsorption energy and the oxygen adsorption energy. So some kind of fine tuning or intermediate values of those gives uh, the best or corresponds to the best turnover frequency. They also identified some alloys. And so with this, we said, well, let's look at these individual metals, deposit them on the activated carbon cloth to see how they perform. And so the first thing we did is we deposited each of these individual metals, uh, copper, ruthenium, iridium, and cobalt. Uh, we didn't use the nickel. There had been some leaching issues with that in the past. We decided to avoid it for now. Maybe we'll go back and look at it. And what we found is, um, despite the DFT results, only one of the metals, copper, really showed promise with respect to reducing nitrate at a potential um, uh, higher than where we get hydrogen evolution reaction. And so it seemed to be the most promising. Um, the other is this is very close to each other, cobalt, iridium, all look very similar. Um, so we then evaluated in the recirculation mode, each of these four different metals and looked at the reaction rate. And as we expected, based on those, or those uh, chronoamperometry experiments, the ruthenium, the iridium, and the cobalt all had poor activity and poor current efficiency than copper. Uh, copper had around 35% current efficiency and fairly good uh, reactivity. And so it looked very favorable. And so we ran a, a bigger suite of experiments on that. We did it at different reduction potentials. And as we expected, and as the chronoamperometry experiments would suggest, we got our uh, best combination of activity and current efficiency at minus 0.9 volts as I just showed in the prior slide. The rates are on the same scale as I've been showing. So they're very comparable to the nitrite, which has very good activity. Um, and for selectivity, it's okay. Uh, for dinitrogen uh, at minus 0.9 volts, we're getting around, I don't know, let's say uh, 40, 50%. Uh, 
We're getting some nitrite, which is produced, uh, which we don't see uh, catalytically generally. And then we're also getting ammonia. And so we'd like to address that. One thing we tried, we thought, well, palladium has been used in the catalytic field uh, to both improve selectivity for dinitrogen uh, and also it's, uh, it rapidly converts nitrite. And so we put very small amounts of palladium with the copper uh, onto this activated carbon cloth. In all cases, the cyclical altometry results indicated that we should get nitrite reduction or nitrate reduction before the onset um, of hydrogen evolution. So that was good. Um, if you look at the reaction rate constant, we get our highest reaction rate constants with small amounts of palladium uh, deposited with the copper. Uh, it goes from 0.5 all the way up to two. And so really improves the, the activity by a factor of almost four uh, compared to what we we're uh, getting previously and going above what our previous batch rates were. We don't really affect our current efficiency. Still stays pretty good, around uh, 30%. That's uh, decent. And if you think about if I improve my activity by a factor of you know, two or three or four, well, uh, maybe a current efficiency of 30%, uh, not too bad. Uh, we can, uh, we're using less metals, uh, although uh, we're have putting in a little bit more current. Uh, if we look at ammonia selectivity uh, or dinitrogen would be the inverse of this. We're not doing a lot better. It's okay, but not great. We're still getting a little too much ammonia, more than we'd like. Um, a big concern with copper, and I think this is the major one, is that we get copper leaching. Uh, as you go through this reduction process, uh, uh, copper uh, becomes, uh, goes through cycles of oxidation and reduction as it reacts with your nitrate. And uh, it starts to, as you can see, uh, come off the activated carbon cloth. We get discoloration on the stainless steel electrode and here's our activated carbon cloth. And so uh, this is a big concern. And so um, that brings up a challenge is uh, copper thus far of the materials we've evaluated shows the best potential for nitrate reduction without hydrogen evolution um, with uh, you know, good current efficiency. It has kind of intermediate selectivity. And so what can we do to improve that? So uh, going forward, uh, we're looking at uh, two uh, kind of hypothesis-based approaches to improve copper performance. Uh, we are alloying copper with a more noble metal uh, with the thought that will stabilize it from oxidative dissolution. Uh, we're also looking at alloying copper with a metal that binds more strongly to nitrogen atoms, uh, such as palladium, to improve selectivity for dinitrogen. Um, and there's some support for these hypotheses and these uh, approaches in our prior work. And so an alloy basically is a, a mixture of uh, these different metals, kind of a random mixture where uh, they're sharing electrons uh, through these uh, unoccupied d orbitals. And what that does is it imparts uh, hydrogenation activity uh, to this gold or silver uh, that's in this alloy, for example, with the palladium. And so previously uh, we've worked with uh, Simon Humphrey in chemistry here. Uh, he has developed this uh, microwave synthesis method. And we integrated uh, with palladium, uh, both uh, uh, gold and silver, uh, separately into uh, different type of nanoparticles to look at their catalytic activity. Um, as I mentioned, you change the chemistry of the metals uh, because of this intermixing of electrons in these D-band orbitals. Um, also, depending on what you substitute in, substitute in for palladium, for example, if we substitute in silver, it's quite a bit uh, less expensive than the palladium, uh, and so you can reduce the catalyst cost. Um, briefly, I wanted to kind of show you the results that we got previously, just you're looking at a catalytic system with palladium and gold, I'm sorry, palladium and silver. Uh, when you look at the alloy, you can see the two metals are mixed together of palladium and silver. When you look at the PXRD spectra, you find that, for example, pure palladium is this uh, kind of, I don't know what you call that, is that magenta or something, that color? And then the uh, pure silver would be the white, and so for a pure palladium, you have a peak right there, but as you substitute in more silver, it shifts. So you're in between those two pure spectra. And when we looked at activity for that in a catalytic system, we found that we got much higher activity by substituting in this silver into the palladium matrix at a reduced cost uh, because you're taking out that precious metal palladium. And that has to do with these binding energies that you're changing 
uh, for the nitrogen uh, and oxygen species to the surface of this catalyst. So uh, we've been now working on taking the copper, which we'd like to stabilize and substituting or making an alloy of copper and uh, gold. That's our first approach. And so uh, just recently, this is hot off the press. This was yesterday. My grad student finally, uh, uh, I shouldn't say finally, he's actually very efficient at this, but it's been some months of trying. Uh, he has synthesized what appears to be the first, our first successful alloy of copper and gold. And it's a copper 20, uh, gold 80. And you can see how the peak is not right on the gold. It's not right on the copper, but in between, and it's biased towards the gold since we have uh, more gold content in there. And so our next step now is to deposit uh, the gold or this alloy, I should say, onto the activated carbon cloth and then uh, evaluate the performance of this uh, alloy relative to pure copper, both respect to the metrics for the kinetics and the current efficiency, but also this stability and looking at if we're getting leaching of this. Uh, one other thing we're also working on is trying to scale up this reactor. You know, currently the reactor is pretty small. It's a few centimeters. Uh, the cathodic sheet, I think the exposed part's like one by two centimeters. And so how can we scale this up? When you think about uh, the dimensions of a system that you want uh, as you make this system bigger, um, we want to look at the performance or when we scale it up to ensure that our uh, uh, resonance time in the reactor, which you could uh, look at as the inverse of this average velocity over the length of the reactor, uh, that resonance time is long uh, compared to the overall reaction rate so that the nitrate has time to react as it flows through. We want to make sure that uh, however we design this reactor, that the time for mass transfer to the surface of these cathodes is uh, short compared to the time scale of reaction so that we don't have a mass transfer limited system. And then we want to design it so that the channels that we're flowing through don't create a large pressure drop. Um, if we're less than five bars, we can design this with uh, kind of low cost materials. Uh, we don't need high pressure fittings or valves or things like that. And so keeping this in mind, uh, we're looking at scale up and how do we design uh, a system that can handle uh, gallons per minute as opposed to mils per minute. Uh, one other thing in our system, we have provided potential control, meaning we fix the potential, for example, at minus 0.6 volts. And when we do that, we can control the reaction for nitrate uh, compared to uh, uh, for hydrogen evolution. Uh, many uh, kind of larger scale reactors uh, that have been developed are running um, uh, the gal galvanic mode where you have a constant uh, current. And with that, uh, there's a greater uh, probability if those potentials are very close to each other that you're going to get both hydrogen evolution and nitrate reduction. And so it might be that we need to operate at a constant potential for this scaled up reactor. And so we're looking at uh, how we can control that. Uh, so uh, in closing, uh, there are a number of catalysts which are sufficiently active to rapidly destroy nitrate. Um, electrocatalysis uh, shows promise uh, for a number of reasons. It uh, uh, practically, it eliminates these hydrogen mass transfer limitations and the handling of this explosive hydrogen gas. It rapidly destroys nitrate uh, with low metal loadings. Uh, and if we have high nitrate concentrations, we get uh, high selectivity, or I should say we uh, anticipate, and there's some evidence that we're getting high selectivity for N2, um, and we're going to confirm that. Um, however, there are several challenges uh, when we're treating low nitrate concentrations. We need improved selectivity uh, for dinitrogen. We're around 40% with the copper. Um, I think, uh, although we have okay, I think uh, uh, current efficiency or the Faraday efficiency, I think improving it uh, uh, certainly would decrease the the energy requirements. And then I think uh, importantly, or uh, uh, one of the most important is improving the stability of this most promising metal, uh, copper. And so it looks to be very, uh, very promising. It's a very inexpensive metal, uh, but how can we get that uh, to be stable, uh, more stable in these systems? And so looking forward, uh, the story's not over. 
These alloy catalysts offer promise of improving copper stability, stability and nitrogen selectivity. Uh, scale up is needed. I think it's promising based on the calculations that we've done. I think these electrocatalyst uh, catalytic systems, uh, they're, uh, they're very promising and I think they are ready to, uh, to be evaluated more fully for treating nitrate in these high strength uh, ion exchange waste brines. I think combined with these systems, you could reuse these uh, brines over and over and significantly reduce your salt costs for these systems uh, and then avoid uh, discharge or disposal costs as well or significantly reduce them. Uh, but I think for direct water treatment, uh, there are still challenges uh, to making this uh, system um, uh, competitive. And I think that requires uh, for improving our uh, uh, selectivity for dinitrogen and also improving the stability uh, of these catalysts. And so with that, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your attention and glad to take any questions. Thank you so much for the talk. And certainly we're very excited to see how this work scales. We, we definitely have a few questions from the audience and it looks like we have a couple of minutes to get to just a few of them. Um, one that I think stands out um, is a sort of big framing question is, how do the economics of catalytic versus electrocatalytic compare? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, the electrocatalytic system is uh, with the rea reaction rates that we've measured are, um, uh, are uh, improved over the catalytic system. The hydrogen costs or are comparable or a little less expensive. Uh, the catalyst costs, uh, when we're using the palladium indium are uh, almost uh, identical. We're using uh, almost the same loadings. When we go to copper, the costs just drop, uh, you know, by a, a small, they're a small fraction of what they were with palladium. So if we can come up with a copper system, they'll be very advantageous. Uh, and then the rates that we're getting with the electrocatalytic system are similar to the batch reactions in the catalyst system. So the electrocatalytic system, I think, shows um, more promise in terms of the cost because we don't have these mass transfer limitations. Great, yeah, another question came up about, um, you know, cost and, and feasibility. So this question reads, many people are interested in converting nitrate to ammonia for resource recovery. However, ammonia is fairly soluble. What concentration of nitrate is needed for ammonia production and extraction to be technically and financially feasible? Oh boy, that, that's a great question. And one I, I haven't evaluated fully. Um, you know, my intuition tells me you need a concentrated nitrate stream to make ammonia conversion and recovery uh, economically uh, uh, reasonable. Technically, you could probably do it almost any concentration uh, given, you know, uh, funds were unlimited. But I think economically, uh, for example, when you look at these ion exchange waste brines, uh, they have very high nitrate concentrations. And so you're going to get a concentrated ammonia in those. And then you could look at a gas liquid membrane module, for example, uh, where you shift the, the pH uh, to convert the ammonium to ammonia and then recover it that way. Uh, but I don't know, I haven't gone through all the economics carefully, so I can't comment where that cutoff is. Absolutely. Um, one other question um, that came up was, for the electrochemical reduction of nitrites slash nitrates, how much hydrogen is produced? Yeah, uh, if you look stoichiometrically, uh, you know, the amount, if you have 100% current efficiency, I'm trying to remember now with this, uh, maybe I should ask Brian, he'll probably remember better than me. Uh, but stoichiometrically, is it uh, three and a half moles of hydrogen per mole of nitrate or four moles of hydrogen per mole of nitrate. I can't remember exactly, uh, but um, that would be if you have 100% current efficiency. Um, if your current efficiency goes down, you need more uh, atomic hydrogen, or if you're doing catalytic system, um, if you're not uh, using all that hydrogen for the nitrate reduction, your demands go up. Um, the, when you have um, high, or I should say more negative uh, potentials that you're applying. And so you're having to provide a higher over potential. That's where you get in the situation when you were evolving hydrogen gas and that hydrogen gas is being lost from the system. And then 
the amount of hydrogen you're using for nitrate reduction just drops and our current efficiencies are just a few percent. So you're way over producing it. So uh, maybe that's uh, I, I, a little meandering there. So I hope I answered your question. No worries. Um, actually, a sort of related question came up. Um, and the question reads, since a high over potential is needed for nitrate reduction, does that mean that nitrate reduction is occurring via a direct electron transfer mechanism? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, when we look at the nitrite, uh, we clearly see a dip or an increase in current before the onset of nitrite reduction, indicating that we're generating atomic hydrogen and that's a hydrogenation reaction. Uh, for the nitrate, when we use copper, uh, we do see a dip or an increase in the current for nitrate before we see hydrogen evolution, uh, but we haven't been able to distinguish a dip uh, for atomic hydrogen generation in that system, but I'm not sure if we just haven't measured it carefully enough. And so I think that's still uh, open uh, from my perspective. We haven't answered that question uh, to my satisfaction. I, I know others have looked at that and I, I can't recall and I, I haven't looked at it uh, closely enough recently to, to kind of give more insight into that. Sure thing. Um, a, another question that came up from the audience reads, did you experience catalyst poisoning and for how long did you run the system? Yeah, you know, uh, for the electrocatalytic system, I think this is a, an advantage over the catalytic systems. Previously, for example, when we ran those trickle bed reactors, we ran them for uh, several months of continuous operation. Uh, when we ran the brine system, we didn't see, well, we saw initial deactivation and then it plateaued uh, and, and then it was constant over a couple months. And the rates that I showed you are from that kind of steady state rate. They're not from the initial rate. So uh, the, where it plateaued was pretty favorable. When we ran the water system, so the dilute nitrate concentrations without salt, there we saw fouling or we saw a decreasing catalytic activity over time. And uh, in some of uh, Brian's earlier work, um, we found that by flushing the catalyst with a buffered hypochlorite uh, uh, liquid, we could get a regeneration of that and most of that activity back. Um, and so th that's possible. But I think the brine basically kills the bacteria so you don't get growth on there. Um, in the electrocatalytic systems, we have seen in, we haven't done uh, very long-term studies like the trickle bed reactor, but when you run these systems for multiple cycles, you'll start to see uh, decreases in activity over time. But the cool thing is uh, if the catalyst is stable like the palladium or the palladium indium, if you reverse the potential and uh, then apply a, a, a positive potential there. So you oxidize uh, the surface of these catalysts, you reverse that, uh, that decline in activity and we regain that activity back or we've shown or we found that in our lab. And so that's pretty neat uh, that you have that ability to in situ kind of uh, um, reverse uh, that uh, uh, poisoning or fouling. That is um, su super interesting. And thank you so much for humoring us with that rapid fire round of questions just there. That looks like that's about all of the time that we have. So really quickly, um, just wanted to say thank you again, Dr. Worth and, and again, also Brian for getting us uh, all teed up here and just wanna quickly share some ways to stay, stay connected with current. Um, if you can all see this. Um, we love to engage with our partners, both new and ex existing partners. So please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, if you are someone who either has um, a, a high school age student at home or, or knows educators in your network, we recently put out um, a new resource on our Blue EDU page called River Lab, um, and that is a high school STEM curriculum that's free and online and gets kids interested in water and water quality. Um, and also stay in touch with us on social media for updates about this year's Chicago Water Week, which we'll announce shortly. And if you scan that QR code on the right, you'll see a bit more information about future events that we have coming up just like this and some other different ones as well. Let's see if we get that slide to move, there we go. Um, and please stay in touch with us if you're interested in getting involved with Current really in any way. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are truly powered by the amazing partnerships that empower our work. So please reach out if we can be helpful or if you have any interest in collaborating. So I'll leave you all on this slide. This is our executive director, Elena Harkness's contact info, but our whole team's emails can be found on our website. So please don't hesitate to shoot us an email. 
Thanks so much, everyone. Um, again, a last thank you to our speaker, a really incredible talk. And uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. We'll see you next time.